section, we are going to have uh, Alan from IBM. He is uh, actually also supporting API Days Hong Kong PFSD and also other API Days event. So uh, hello, Alan. So try to show your screen. Hello, Hi. Alan. Nice to meet you again. Nice to see you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Alan will be talking about the, the APIs, how did we get there and how and where we are going next. So it should be a very, some some uh, training topics. So uh, Alan, I will pass the time to you. So can you share about the, the screen first? And then I, I'm trying to ensure that it's good. Okay, so I can see the screen. So okay. let me pass the time to you. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Great, thank you. So thanks, Patrick, and it's a pleasure to be with you in Hong Kong. I wish I was actually there. Uh, maybe one of these days we'll get back to that. But um, as Patrick said, my name is Alan Glickenhaus. I'm from IBM. I'm the digital transformation business strategist, and I work with customers around the world on uh, APIs and digital transformation and, and you know how do you what's coming next and all that kind of thing. So uh, I created this presentation, did it once before, and uh, you're the second time I'm doing it. And hopefully I'll do it better this time. Uh, I think it went okay the first time. But anyway, I've got, I'm gonna cover about 40 years of history in about 20 minutes and, 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 and as well as looking a little bit into the future. So the previous person who introduced me called this my back to the future presentation. So uh, so I like that name, so I'm, I'm going with that. So, so um, my role uh, is on this slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just to save uh, a few minutes. But um, the the key thing for you to pick up is that I, I do speak to a lot of businesses around the world about their strategy and what they're trying to do. And when I'm not speaking to them and working with them, I'm writing about it. So I've written over 160 different papers, articles, blogs, things like that. Uh, and they're listed in the um, the categories at the bottom of the page. At the end of the deck, there'll be three pages of links to all this content. So we give that to you. So when you get this content and download it, you'll have links to all of all the things that I've written about. Um, so today we're just going to cover a few from the first category on digital business and digital transformation. All right. So and, you know, as I said, I'm the business strategist. I'm often asked, "What's next? Where should you know what's what's coming next?" And the answer to this question, I have to look to the future. But actually, I'm looking to the past. And, and why I say that um, is because, of course, nobody can actually see what's in the future, but you can see what happened in the past and you can try to figure out the patterns of how things work. And, and so what we've seen in this space is a series of challenges that were faced that we applied certain solutions to to overcome them. And then there was the next set of challenges and, and, and we overcame those and then the next set of challenges. So I'm going to walk you through those challenges and, and, and see the things that have happened along the way. And then we'll see how things are working today and what the next challenges are, are that we're facing now and how we might overcome these. So that's the agenda for this particular session. And hopefully I'll fly through this very quickly and, and, and get through it in the 20 plus minutes that we have together. Um, so starting off, uh, and I'm talking 40 years ago now, um, so I've been in IT for 40 years. Uh, and, and so 40 years ago, when I first started, programs you know, were not written as well as they are today. And, uh, and, and so you might have a program that has good value and you'd like to use it, but the question was how to call that program to get the use out of it. And at that time, people were not structuring programs well with a certain set of code for the interface and another code, set of code for the business logic and another set of code for data access. It was all intermingled together. And, and so um, there were also issues with storage and memory and, and so on that drove people to create very uh, difficult for humans to use screens because we could just put small amounts of, uh, of you know, codes into the fields rather than type full words because the, the memory was, was an issue. So in order to use these applications uh, to call them, we had to do what we call screen scraping. We had to make believe we were entering the information on the screen uh, as a human would do to actually invoke the program and get the response back. So this was not a very easy way to integrate uh, with with other programs, eventually people got better about that and started to separate the uh, the user interface uh, and would create what we call technical APIs. These these are not the APIs that API Days is all about, uh, yeah, but but uh, more traditional old technical APIs that a particular program uh, developer would write that would expose the interface for what their program could do, and they were often extremely difficult to use. Um, 
and very much uh, provi provider focused. They would allow you to do the things that that particular program could do, which not, might not be everything that you want to do. It might be more than what you want to do, but it, it, it just exposed everything uh, that the program could do. And you'd invoke it with a, a remote procedure call uh, to, to get to that. Um, so that's where things were about 40 years ago. Um, as they then started to look to, well, how do I communicate with another business? If I'm in a supply chain scenario or you know any other business that I want to deal with, uh, I, I really can't use an RPC to call across the businesses. Uh, security issues as well as non-standard interfaces were, were just some of the issues that were involved there. So uh, what we could do is, is send a file, right? So we could put records in a file. They wouldn't be actual vinyl records, but, but we put records in a file and then we'd send the file to another company and they could take the records out and do that. And we'd have to agree on the format of the records in the file so that we could uh, create them appropriately and read them appropriately. And so, so file transfers, you know, was the way we did that. And that eventually became uh, or got enhanced to become uh, electronic data interchange, EDI, which was supported by evaluated networks that allowed for more standardized formats uh, uh, that people would not have an individual format that they would have to negotiate between every company. So the next challenge we had was reliability and availability. So we're moving ahead about 10 years. It's now about 30 years ago. Uh, the client server was the, the the big new thing that was happening at that time. And we had a lot of little systems popping up everywhere. Um, Intel servers and Unix servers and mainframes and and, and so on and so forth. And, and if you had an application on one system that wanted to call an application on another system, there was an issue of network reliability or the application may not be available or the system might not be available. Any particular outage could be an issue that would stop me from successfully calling a program on another system. And so I, I needed to either code for that in my system, in my application, or figure out some way to, to make sure that things didn't fail um, if the other system or network was not available. So what we did was introduce messaging and messaging, uh, basically relieve the the uh, developer of that problem. So instead of you having to figure out that the message get to the other system uh, uh, correctly, uh, you could just put a message in a message queue and the messaging middleware would move it to the other system. And if the network was down or the system was down or the application was down, whatever would cause it to not successfully be transmitted, the middleware would hold the message until it became available again and then make sure it got there once and only once. And so this, you know, offloaded that work from the developer to make sure that that would be connected correctly. And after this, there were some add-on things with different patterns, one-to-many and pub-sub and, and other things came out of that. <clears throat> so now that we can get messages across, that was good. Um, but we started to get um, an issue where each application that wanted to reference the data would, would have its own definition of, of what that data would be. And some applications would call it one thing and other applications would call it something else. And maybe, you know, one had a field for name and another one had first name and last name as two fields and address could be any number of different things. And, and you know, then we had to deal with all the applications that dealt with this particular kinds of data. And so tailoring calls to all the different applications uh, with each one of their different structures of data definitions became a, a real nightmare. We called it spaghetti uh, issues. And, and so the idea of handling all these point-to-point -point applications, which was okay if you had two or three applications, but not okay once you get to 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 or, or more, uh, it became really impossible to manage uh, every application trying to individually connect to every other application. And so message brokers was the first step to solve this with a hub and spoke integration pattern um, that helped get rid of the, the spaghetti issue because everything just connected to the message broker and then it came out from there. Um, and then we added on top of that uh, service oriented architecture, which is a big deal, uh, probably about a little less than 20 years ago now. Um, and, and that added the concept of services. Uh, as a standard interface for a way to access systems. And they could be traditional old systems uh, or new systems or even multiple systems that you wanted to shield the user from knowing that, that things were in multiple systems. And uh, around that was largely based uh, around an enterprise service bus architecture um, that all you needed to do was connect to the enterprise service bus 
and it would know how to route and transform things to get things to the other uh, applications that needed that. And then there was a lot of governance around that to drive the reuse of these services so that uh, people would not duplicate things and end up back in the spaghetti problem that we had before. So the real benefit from this that came out of it was a separation of concerns, right? You worry about your business logic in your application. You let the enterprise service bus worry about the integration between the applications and the transformation of the data and so on. And a whole field of application integration uh, built up around that to do those kinds of transformation and protocol conversions and routing. <clears throat> All right. So now we finally get to um, the API era. So we're now talking about 10 ish years ago. Um, and, um, so SOA solved a lot of issues, but it also, you know, had some, some issues of its own. The services that we created tended to be fairly big. I mean, if you had a customer information service, it had all the information possible that you could have about a customer or an order information service or an account information service or whatever service you had, they were often very big to handle all the possibilities of what somebody would want from that particular data uh, structure. Um, but the consumer often didn't want all of the data. They wanted a small subset of that data. And it was very difficult to deal with all the parameters you'd have to give in and all the data that came back to, uh, to parse through to find the little bits of the data that you cared about. Um, governance while a good thing in driving the single uh, version of the truth became a little bit burdensome in, in the sense of um, making sure that while we were driving reuse, which was good, we didn't want to overload the system. Uh, and so there was a big concern about how much resource somebody was going to use. Um, and, and it was very time consuming because there was no automatic way to bring on consumers of the service. So it became a very manual uh, process where you contacted someone who owned the service and they would give you the access to it um, and, and then ask you how much you were going to use and, and try to control uh, the amount of use on the service. So it was a very manual thing around this good idea of the reuse uh, and service orientation. Um, but we wanted to have a customer focused consumption model so you could get what you want without all these burdens of, of having to parse through everything and making it hard to come on board. So APIs, today's APIs, uh, are what we're talking about now as the solution to that, where we create a consumer-oriented view on top of the provider-oriented backends that we have. So I might have an ordering system and an inventory system and a, um, a, 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 a CRM system or whatever they are, and they do what they do, but the consumer wants to see something that maybe uh, uses all of them. And so we can expose a consumer orientation that is a view into that and allow for self-service onboarding and security gateways that protect the backends from overuse uh, so that you won't go over the amount that the backends can handle, as well as analytics for what's going on so we can see uh, how things are working. <clears throat> now, based on top of this uh, ability for business APIs, a lot of new things happened. The API economy started to be uh, spoken about. My, my job came into being. Um, monetization, which is a topic I've spoken about at other API days, conferences, how to make money from APIs. Digital transformation, I'll come back to that thought in a second. And ecosystems and marketplaces are some of the newer things that are happening that are all enabled by the fact that we have business APIs today to do this with. So very big step forward, but even APIs didn't solve everything, right? So the next things that happen uh, are people are starting to go to microservices and, and cloud, and, and we need to uh, connect all these microservices together, and all of them are not necessarily located in the same location. Some may be on uh, Amazon cloud or IBM cloud or Google cloud or whatever, and, and you don't want to have to come back to a centralized integration place like an enterprise service bus or even a gateway in one place to necessarily go back out to the cloud again to do something else to get a, another piece of information. So, you know, just over time, we've moved from this centralized ESB thought to enabling access through socialized APIs to then starting to fine grain our um, applications in microservices to now actually fine graining our integration capabilities, both the APIs and the integrations so that they can be deployed in the cloud wherever they need to be. This gives us a lot of flexibility to not have to come to a single uh, place 
to then connect back out again and, and also gives us the ability to um, manage different versions of integration. So if something needs to take advantage of a new version, but we don't need to do a big bang change of the integration layer to make everything go to that, it gives me a lot more flexibility to migrate forward in the future. So we get a lot of decentralization for agility by having a microservice based integration set of capabilities in the areas of API and application integration, as well as for the applications themselves. Uh, the next thing that we need to see that was a challenge is scalability and performance. So, you know, now that everything is wonderful, we got lots of APIs out there. People are, are calling our APIs. The usage is increasing, right? So the number of backend transactions is going up and we have to handle the scale with necessarily, you know, performance, right? And, and if we start to just keep adding more resources to the backend, that can get very expensive. So you can deal with caching as, as one of the possibilities to do some things for that. But the other thing that you can do is, is use events. And so events, Kafka uh, came about, you know, with the last couple of years, we're now in, um, you know, from the microservices through events uh, where we can move the data to the application in advance of it needing it. So now we don't have to do an API call to find out what the inventory level is for a particular product we want to order. When the inventory is updated, we can just push that out as a publication and whoever subscribes to it can get that information. And now in my application, I can see uh, that immediately without having to put an API call that would drive traffic on the backend systems for every request. So it gives us a nice ability to move uh, the data to where it's needed in advance. And of course, that gives us better performance and scale on the back end where we only are doing transactions that need to come to the back end, not for read only kinds of things. All right. So let me take a breath and ask a, a little question to myself because you're not going to be able to answer this one uh, in the mode we're in now. If, um, so I've discussed a bunch of different types of integration capabilities. I started with screen scraping and file and EDI and messaging, application integration, business APIs with the gateway and events, right? So I just went through 40 years uh, of integration history in 15 minutes or so. Uh, what, do you, what can you tell about that list of integration uh, capabilities? And, and the answer is they all still exist. So not a single one of these things has gone away. Um, every one of these new things that has come out has added to the capabilities that we've had before. It hasn't replaced it. And so um, all of these and any future things we do will probably continue to add to the set of capabilities that we need or have in our integration toolkit. And we can use the appropriate ones to, to solve the appropriate challenges. And often multiple of these are used together. And that, that's really the key point that I want to make in this whole presentation is that no one of these is an island, right? So, you know, when you invoke an API, what happens after the API is called? Well, oftentimes the applications are invoked using application integration and messaging. Um, or if you look at it from the opposite side, if you have an application integration and messaging, how do you invoke it? It's often through an API, right? It's, um, when you uh, have an event that occurs and it may trigger something, it triggers a need for an action, maybe you'll call an API to take that action. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, that may be used together. And when you do uh, deal with files, how do you create the file in the record format that you want? And how do you read the file records at the other side? The often, the answer is application integration. Uh, and, and, and finally, back to the oldest thing I spoke about with screen scraping, this is actually a very hot item right now using robotic process and automation allows applications that still have these horrible, ugly interfaces to work with other applications in a process or a larger integration context. So, so these things are not independent. I mean, they, they, they work together and you should think about what tools do I need to do the job that I'm trying to accomplish. And here's just an example of that, right? So, so we may have an order uh, management example where we have an API that we expose in our gateway that places uh, that takes orders. And, and so somebody might place an order and it comes into the gateway and that then triggers the application integration to go to the CRM system and get information about the consumer, go to the inventory system to get information about the inventory, place the order, send something to the logistics system and the finance system for billing. And once the orders are, are processed, the events may kick off that say the order is shipped and when you should receive it, right? So, so all these different technologies can work together in, in an overall business scenario. 
And if a bad person comes in and tries to do something, we just kick them out and don't let them do anything. Right. So um, so, you know, the, these things are, are you know, very often uh, in real scenarios used together. So um, now I mentioned digital transformation before, and I'm not going to have the time to get into this in a lot of detail here. But when you think about what's going on in digital transformation, there's a whole set of technology things that are happening, business models and, and, and organizational things that are happening. But the largest change, in, in my opinion, is the change in perspective from going from a, a business provider perspective. I'm a bank and I do banking things or I'm a retailer and I sell whatever products I sell to a consumer orientation where it's what is the customer trying to accomplish? And, and so often when you look at things from the customer perspective, any one industry or company is a part of the solution, but not the whole solution. And that creates digital ecosystems. And again, it's one of the topics that I mentioned before and that I've spoken about at other API Days conferences. Um, when you think about what's going on in the world right now, and we've talked about all these things, uh, I think, except for AI, we, uh, we have talked about the API economy, microservices and cloud already, artificial intelligence being another thing that people are starting to use your business may be using these and so are your ecosystem partners. And so as you're trying to put together this consumer oriented digital transformation solution, the challenge is integration. Uh, business executives are wanting to do digital transformations and 70% of the time the projects are failing due to a lack of integration quality. It's because they just can't keep up with the need for what's going on here. And, and this is dealing with the challenge that we're seeing today. So I'm going to move into my last bit of the, the presentation here, uh, which is how do we address the challenge that is in front of us, which is scaling um, this, uh, this integration capability so that we can handle the rapid needs of digital transformation. And, and this is not something I'm going to be able to say, hey, IBM has this product, buy it. We, we have a product which will help you, but you're going to have to do things with your own people and processes uh, with your architecture and, and of course some technology as well. So I'm not going to have the time to get into all of that, uh, but the, the need for integration is increasing. The need to scale the ability to do integration is increasing, to deliver quality integration. And so what we need to do to enable uh, the business to handle this in a quality way that can allow for the 70% number that are failing to be drastically reduced is automation and artificial intelligence. By using automation to speed the integration development and remove manual tasks, we can also reduce the potential for errors. And by using artificial intelligence to capture the expertise of the central integration team that's a real expert uh, in integration, we can start to then apply that AI to people who are not integration experts, but allow them to do the integrations that they can do without being an expert using the in intelligence that we've captured from the experts. And so I'm not suggesting that the central um, integration team is gonna go away, but we wanna allow them to do the hard things that they need to do uh, and allow the simpler things that can be done by normal developers who don't have a focus on integration to be done. And the way we're going to do that is through automation and artificial intelligence. And so that's my prediction for the future of where things are going. And in fact, it's what we're recommending and including in our products. So in IBM, we have a product for integration called the Cloud Pack for Integration. It contains all of the integration patterns, technologies that we've had previously sold as uh, individual products. You probably have heard of API Connect and some of the other products um, that we have. Those still could buy them individually if you like, but but we think the better choice is to buy this one package of, of all the capabilities and it's built on top of AI and automation. And, and this is really where we're investing our thoughts and strategy to, to make integration simpler and scale out for more people to be able to use. So uh, my final thoughts on this, have a good set of integration tools and use the right tool for the job. Oftentimes I see a business that has bought one thing, maybe because we're at an API conference, maybe you have an API solution, but then that API solution is not going to do events. It's not going to do um, application integration, right? But you often stretch it to try to do those kinds of things and it doesn't work quite as well. 
Um, so, so think about, you know, is that really the best way to, to attack a problem? Maybe using the right tool for the job is a better option. Good integration patterns never die. You just add more, right? So look at what we've done to get to this point. You can see that every one of these things continue to exist. Um, and, and, you know, think about, you know, how, how you can use these things and, and what the best technique for the job is. And then as, as you're thinking about your strategy to move forward, what constraints are you seeing that are holding you back? And could you benefit from maybe using multiple styles of integration together and using automation and AI uh, to avoid any constraints that you may have? So that is where we are today and where I think we're going tomorrow um, as rapidly as I could possibly get through that deck. Uh, there are, like I mentioned, a couple of slides at the back here for links to the different um, things that I've written about. The two at the bottom of the first page here on the right, good integrations, patterns never die, you just add more, and a perspective on current integration scenarios and what might follow are the two that are largely what's in this presentation. And the rest of this are links that you can click on, and there's multiple pages of them um, that, that hopefully um, when you get these slides you can use. Patrick, that's as fast as I could do it. Um, uh, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, you are. You are having a very good time control. So, uh, maybe I think just uh, one, one, one quick, quick question. So, sure. um, I think you you share a lot of uh, the thought and tooling etc. And then you mentioned the digital transformation, and it should be uh, one one of the hardest thing because it's involve not only technical but also people mindset. Maybe if do you have one one quick um uh, uh sharing. He's talking about how maybe a, a lot of people here is from the working level or, or maybe a technical architect or even business user. How can they uh, maybe uh, try uh, help to convince uh, maybe their, their, their business line manager why their API transformation is um, is key to them? So do you have one or two sentences? Boy, to, that's to a, I, I can do another 25 minutes on that question. So uh, yeah, uh, just it, one, it's, just it's, a single one. It's, it's really a challenge. <laughs> I mean, so from a technical implementer perspective, you know, you've got access to the, the technologies, right? And if you look back at the chart that I had, there's a definition that has three parts to it. There's a technology part, there's a business innovation and, and organizational part, and then there's a perspective part, which is about that mm. change in perspective from the company that you're in to the customer. And I think you can start talking about uh, the technology from the customer perspective. So, mm. so as you think about APIs, um, don't think about APIs as far as what they deliver from the provider perspective. Think about it from the consumer perspective. And, and then talk to your um, business leaders and, and the management about how that can bubble up, right? So if you can bubble up that consumer-oriented thinking from we have a CRM system and I can access it with an API and blah, 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 or whatever, that's not the answer. The answer is I need to access the CRM system and these other systems and the consumer wants to get one answer, not three, right? And, and so, so think about consumer provider or consumer orientation versus provider orientation. And the more you get yourself out of the provider organization or, orientation, you will have better APIs. They'll be backward compatible better. So it'll benefit you. Uh, but it will also benefit the business in, in showing them how we can then take this and use it in a solution for the cu customer. So that's my my two minute answer yep. on that one. I, I yeah, can, thanks for the tips. And it's really challenging. Because I think this is the topmost uh, question we heard from yeah. the uh, community here. So I think your your, your sharing is very ins uh, inspiring. So I yeah, thanks for, again for Alan's for your sharing. So uh, we are now actually going to our lunch break. So we are having a, very, a, lunch, a Hong Kong style lunch break. So we will have uh, more than an hour so uh feel free to take the chance to visit our booth and then maybe if you have some question you can also wish out uh, alan offline and then uh, don't forget that we also have a treasure hunt booth so you can try to leverage uh, uh levigate that and then see uh what's the offering from different sponsor etc from ibm etc so uh don't don't waste your time there so um uh, the don't don't waste your time to uh, try to explore explore more on this uh, booth section uh especially for a treasure hunt so thanks again alan so Thank I'll you. see you soon. Take I'll care. see you next year. Yeah.